So hi everyone, uh, I'm Anna Hit and I'm from Ule. And it's nice to see so many of you still here, though it's Thursday evening and it's been a long day and, and all that, but try to bear with me. The last presentation will be excellent, that I can promise. But um, I'm going to talk to you today about the stuff we are doing at ULE and in particular some uh, data streaming and serverless data streaming. So first uh, it will be a short introduction about who we are, who I am and what we do and why we do that. Then I'll go a bit into technical details and, and tell you about some stuff that we learned along the way. And well, short introduction first. Well, I've been working at Soleta for quite some time now, actually soon to be 10 years. And uh, well, as a software designer, which means I've pretty much done everything, including some AWS certifications and stuff like that. But uh, I'm here today because I've been a part of the data and AI team at ULE. And I've been working along some really brilliant people, some from ULE, some from Reactor, Forkine, Wunderdog. Hi, Tommy, thank you for coming. We have done a fair share of peer coding with Tommy. We'll continue on Monday. Uh, Sealy Solutions, uh, Kodan, and, well, me from Solita. And uh, I've been there for two years now. And the headquarters of ULE is at Pasila. And, uh, well, I personally live in Tampere which means the trains got pretty familiar for me. And, well, I spent one day a week away, and that's pretty much what my work days look like. But now to the business. So, Ule. I guess most of you know here that Ule is the Finnish broadcasting company. But, um, and, and you probably know the Ule Arena, the, the streaming service, or the biggest Finnish streaming service. One thing you probably don't know is that Ule is the only streaming service in the world that beats Netflix in its region. So, Arena is more popular in Finland than Netflix, and no other local streaming service can say that in any country. So, that's pretty cool, I think. So, what our team does is, uh, for example, we are responsible for arena recommendations and some arena image personalization. Like, for example, we show different images for the same content for different kinds of users. So we try to figure out your profile and what you will like and what will uh, get your attention. And we personalize the image for you. Uh, some ULEFI article recommendation, radio recommendation, we have been a part of Uutisvahti smart notifications, and there is a bunch of internal tools that we are working on, or responsible for. And for example, there is Onibot, which is a journalist assistant that helps journalists to create better content. And guys are working at the moment on uh, automating the extraction of images from a video stream and extracting some trailers from video stream using machine learning. So, some pretty cool stuff. And uh, what we are dealing with on a day-to-day basis, well, it's data. Uh, it's mostly user interaction data, and uh, when I say user interaction data, it's what happens when you press the play button in, in Arena, or you scroll through some articles, or, or whatever content you're consuming. There is some interaction, and we get information about that. And it's pretty much JSON, not rocket science. A bunch of labels, some values, like, for example, here, we can say that what, this one was from ULE TV1, and it was a start event, so the one that is sent when the user plays, uh, presses play button. And this one is from live TV, not video on demand. And this particular one was from the Eduskunta Vaalit 2019 Tulosilta, which has a special place in my heart. <laughs> I'll talk a bit about it later. Um, so the, the result of the parliamentary elections in Finland this spring. Uh, we get another bunch of information from here, like the device you are using and, and stuff like that. But that's pretty much the user interaction data that we get. Uh, what we do with it? Well, we, we first of all collect the data, of course. We store the data in our data lake. Uh, we visualize the data with all sorts of dashboards and visualizations for internal use. And then we utilize the data in things like machine learning and, and things that I've mentioned before. But why do we do that? Well, pretty much to understand the customers that ULE has, to understand them better and to help provide better services for everyone. And in this case, everyone means the entire Finnish population because, well, it's a publicly owned company and it's taxpayers' money we are talking about. 
And actually, that's a pretty cool stuff that we are not actually trying to maximize some advertisement or money flow because, well, Ule doesn't have that. We just try to make things a bit better. And at least for me, that's been quite motivating. But lyrics aside, so how much data are we talking about? I would say that it's roughly half a million requests per day, and the one request is the user, one user interaction. And here on the right, you can see our Grafana dashboard, and in the top left corner is the weekly view of the request that hit our load balancer. And you can see that they go up and down according to the usage during the day. So people sleep at night and don't use it that much, then they wake up and, and the usage grows up, and then it peaks around the evening hours, and then it goes down again. And around the evening hours, we get around 600,000 requests per minute, if nothing happens. But I have seen so far, the maximum I have seen so far has been around two and a half million requests per minute, and that was that exact election night. Um, the thing was that it coincided with the finals of Women's Hockey World Championship, and well, Finland was playing, and everybody who wasn't watching the election result night they were watching the hockey. So basically, I was on call that night, and I, I needed to take or to make sure that our system runs smoothly, even though the, the load was pretty heavy. Um, I would say that I got several gray hairs that night, but we have learned some, some lessons from that, and, and things didn't go as bad as they could. But yeah, we occasionally get pretty high load if something happens. Sometimes we can't predict that, like with sport events. Sometimes we can't when there are some unfortunate events in, in the world and people go to ULE to, to see what happened. So all that requests end up in around 500 gigabytes of data per day. And we store it mostly in Apache Parquet and, and JSON format. So to our architecture. So ULE uses AWS as their uh, public cloud provider, and this is a very uh, broad stroke picture of the architecture that we have there. It's missing a lot of parts and, and uh, it's not complete, but it gives an overall picture. I'm not going to go into the details of the entire architecture, don't worry. Instead, I'm going to concentrate only on the serverless streaming part of it. And if you don't have prior uh, AWS data streaming experience or AWS experience whatsoever. I hope you learn something tonight. And if you do, I hope you still learn something tonight. So, serverless. In the words of Dr. Werner Wogels, the CTO of Amazon, no server is easier to manage than no server. And, well, you can't really argue with this one. Actually, Dr. <coughs> Werner Wogels is very, fam very famous for a lot of quotes and uh, like good ones, so this one I like a lot. And uh, we try to have as little servers to manage as possible. And here is the part of our pipeline which we try to make serverless. So here I must say, right in the beginning, it's kind of a lie. It's not completely serverless. So in the very front of it, we have a service called Analytics Collector, which is respons responsible for receiving the user interaction requests from the users, from, from um, browsers and mobile devices, from smart TVs. And uh, well, it's a server, <laughs> but it's as serverless as it gets. Uh, in AWS, we use Fargate for it, which is a managed Docker or a container service where you can just deploy containers and uh, provide some uh, CPU and memory requirements and also rules how it should be scaled, and then AWS manages it for you. So you don't really have to manage the servers. So in that sense, it is kind of serverless. But I'm not going to go into the details of that one. So um, what Analytics Collector does, as I said, it collects the data, and then it sends it for, well, it does some magic and processing and whatnot, but then it sends it forward to a, kine or to a stream. And here we get into a bit more details. So, as a stream, we use the fully managed service called uh, Kinesis Data Streams, and it's basically a massively scalable service to stream your data. Uh, the data is available within milliseconds after you write it to the stream, and is there for from 24 hours to seven days. So you can replay the data in case you need it. 
Uh, to consume the stream, you have to write your own custom stream consumers, and there are many options for that. I'm not going to go into that now. We are personally using Lambda functions as our stream consumers, and I'll talk a bit, a bit about it a bit later. So the way that the Kinesis stream is uh, being massively scalable is using so-called shards. So shard is basically a unit of parallelism in, inside the Kinesis stream, and you can think of it as a sort of a ordered queue, so first in, first out queue inside the stream. And the stream is actually a, a collection of those queues. So each shard has a throughput of one megabyte per second, or can accept one megabyte per second and 1,000 records per second. So if you have more data coming in, you need more shards. So if you remember, I said we have roughly 600,000 requests per minute in the evening hours. So it makes about 10,000 requests per second if we assume that they are kind of stable and, and going in kind of flow, which doesn't happen, but let's assume that. So 10,000 requests per second. With 1,000 requests per shard, we would need at least 10 shards to manage the data and to stream it forward. We actually do use 32 shards in that particular stream because we want to be on the safe side and not to lose any data when we have peak, like unexpected peaks. But it's not uncommon to use a very big amount of shards if you have a lot of data coming in. But you might think, why not to add as many shards as possible and just like let it there? Well, of course, there's a catch there. Each shard costs something. So you don't only pay for the data you are streaming, but you're also paying for each active shard. So it's basically a compromise how much you want to pay. And there are some other things to consider I might mention later. Uh, so oh, I forgot to mention how um, shards are actually working. So when you send the data to the stream, uh, you have the payload. And you also have something called partition key. And the Kinesis stream calculates the hash of the partition key. And each shard is assigned uh, basically a bucket of, of um, hash values. So for every single incoming record and every single, every single partition key, there is one particular shard that that record goes to according to that partition key. Um, so Basically, what you need to do is to choose as random of a partition key as possible so your data goes pretty much equally to your different shards and you wouldn't have a situation when all the, or all the requests are going to just one shard and all the rest are idle because, well, you will, get, you will exceed your throughput because, as you see, you have 1,000 requests per minute or per second per shard. So there are things to consider here. And how do we write to the Kinesis stream? Well, there are many options, or actually three. You can use um, a Kinesis producer library. You can use a Kinesis agent. Those are a bit higher level uh, options. But we personally use an AWS SDK for that. And AWS SDK has two uh, methods or two functions to write to the Kinesis stream. One is to write a single record, so put record, and then put records is for a batch operation. So you could, can put up to 500 records into a stream at once, which is also always a recommendable way to do because you will save on API calls and on network and whatnot. Uh, and basically, the parameters of, or the, the params argument of that method looks like this. It's just an array of records that you want to put, and then the name of the string that you want to put. And each record, as I showed in the previous slide, is just the payload and the partition key for the shard it's, it's supposed to be going. So like for, as I mentioned, the partition key should be as random as possible, and we are using user ID as a partition key for us, because, well, it's random enough, and then if you remember, I said that each shard is ordered, so we actually want that the events of the same user go to one shard and they are ordered there. So we want to preserve that order there. So that's why we use it as, as our partition key. So if for some reason the put records, put records request didn't go through, after all the retries and, and error handling, we send it to a dead letter queue. And, and for a dead letter queue, we chose a SNS, which is a fully managed pops up service, also serverless. So, what happens after that? 
As I mentioned before, we use lambdas as our stream consumers, and it actually saves us a lot of headache of managing the shards and, and the order of reading from different shards and where we are in a particular shards and, and all that things. So lambda takes care of that on your behalf, which is pretty cool. But of course, it has a couple of things you have to take into consideration. So how it works is that each shard is invoking one lambda at the same time. So you can have at most the same amount of lambdas running concurrently at any given time as there are shards. So let's say you have a stream with 10 shards, you will have 10 concurrent lambdas reading from that stream. And that's an important point, because even though lambdas are scaling endlessly, that's the, the best serverless technology ever existing and whatnot, but the, the truth of the matter is there are limits. And uh, each account comes with a limit of uh, concurrent Lambda executions. So by default, it's 1,000 concurrent executions per account. And you can rise that limit, yes, but again, with, with some support tickets and explanations and stuff, but still, it's gonna, there's going to be a limit. So you, if, for example, you have the 1,000 concurrent Lambda limit, and then you have a Kinesis stream with 1,000 1, shards, so you end up in a situation where you have 1,000 Lambda functions just consuming your stream. That's fine until somebody else wants to run another Lambda function that does something else. But they can't anymore because, well, your Lambda budget is spared on the Kinesis stream. So basically, you have to be careful with how things uh, scale and, and how the, the resources are used. Uh, so the Lambda functions work by pulling, pulling the Kinesis stream once per second, or more often if there are more, more records, co records coming in. And one very important point here is that if there is an error while processing a batch of records from a Kinesis stream, a Lambda function will try automatically to process it until it succeeds or until the data expires. So if you remember, I said the data is in the Kinesis stream is stored for from 24 hours to seven days. So imagine it's 24 hours, you have um, somewhat bad, uh, bad record in that batch, and Lambda can't process it. So it tries and tries and tries again, and there go 24 hours, it can't, data expires, it's gone. Well, that's not a, that a big of a deal on its own, but while the Lambda is processing that bad batch, it doesn't continue reading from that same shard that it's been attached to. So it, all the other shards continue to live their lives, and, and data goes in and out, but that particular shard is blocked until you get a successful read from that, of that bad batch, batch or until the data expires. So when that bad batch expires, you end up in a situation when 24 hours went by and you probably have a shard full of data that is also going to expire or either expired already or also going to expire pretty soon. So you might lose tons of data, actually, if you have just one bad record there. So you need to be very careful with error process or error handling where, when you are dealing with lambdas and, and Kinesis streams. Um, oh, so what does our lambda actually do? Well, it reads the stream and then it filters the data and it tries to, well, as the name might imply, it tries to route the data based on its content. We basically want to separate different kinds of data, so like uh, stream start events, like the play button events, and uh, for example, uh, article view events are completely different, so we want to send them to different places and to process them in, in def different ways. So that's where our router lambda comes in. It does the filtering, it does the routing, and sends them forward. And here comes the second uh, service in the Kinesis family called Kinesis Firehose. And it's also a fully managed service, but unlike Kinesis Streams, it's not meant to stream the data. It's actually built to stream the data into the data lake. So it has a destination where it streams it. And as a destination, you can use uh, S3, Redshift, AWS Elasticsearch, Splunk, and they all come pretty much out of the box. You don't have to write a single line of code. Firehose will handle it for you. Well, of course, if you don't count the, the uh, configuration code as a code. But you, you don't have to write any functions or anything. So uh, it scales automatically. You don't have to go through the headache of sharding and resharding and calculating how much shards you would actually need and how things can go badly and all that things. Firehose handles that for you. 
and moreover, it doesn't have any additional prices for that. You only pay for the data that you are streaming. It's pretty convenient. And uh, it has some pretty cool features just out of the box. So it can batch your data before it delivers it to your destination. It can compress it for you. It can do some minor transformations, or basically any kinds of transformations, because you can attach small so-called transformer lambdas to this firehose, which just reads records from the firehose, transform them, and send them back to the stream. So you can do some minor mappings and things like that before you load the data to the, to the data lake. And then the coolest part is, or one of the cool parts is, they, it can automatically convert, uh, convert from a JSON format to Apache Orc and Apache Parquet col columnar formats. Again, without needing any lines of code, per se. It does use a service, another serverless service called AWS Glue, which I'm not going to go into details here, but it, you can basically think of it as a serverless ETL tool on AWS. And uh, Firehose uses it as a, a data catalog to transform the JSON, the semi-structured JSON data, to the columnar uh, parquet format. So Firehose does all that for you. But one thing that it is, it is lacking is the custom consumer possibility, as it was in Kinesis Stream. So you can't write a Lambda function that reads from the firehose and then sends it somewhere else. The only Lambda functions are the transformer Lambdas, and the only place they send is the same firehose. So not much use in that. And then, so why do I jump over a slide every single time? So our router Lambda, uh, as you remember, it does route the, or it, it gets the data from the Kinesis stream, it decides what, what kind of data it is, and then it routes it to different uh, Kinesis firehoses. So we have a separate firehose for the start events, and for the, uh, for the ha video heartbeats, and uh, page views, and whatnot. So each of them goes to its own firehose, then it goes through a transformer lambda, which does some maps, minor mapping, then it goes uh, through the glue data catalog and is written to S3 as a parquet data. And some of it ends up in Redshift. And all that happens pretty much without a single line of code. But what else do we do with the streaming data, in, uh, just like together with loading it to a data lake? Well, here comes the third component of the Kinesis family, which is called Kinesis Data Analytics. That's a pretty cool little thing which allows you to run SQL queries on your streaming data. It's also a fully managed service. It scales. It's cool. So you, you can basically run all sorts of joins and filters and aggregation functions over some specific time windows on your streaming data while it's being streamed. And after that, even more cool, it can send the results of these queries to another Kinesis data stream, or a firehose, or a Lambda function, which basically means that you can do anything for it, because Lambda function can then propagate it to any other service in AWS or outside of it. And um, data, the Kinesis data analytics applications are used for some real-time uh, fault detection or anomaly detection, some uh, mm, Dashboard, real-time dashboard updates, like KPI updates, maybe some game score updates, and things like that. Things when you need the real data really fast, and you need to kind of do some aggregation or analysis of that data. Uh, remember, I said you can't attach a custom consumer to a Kinesis Firehose. Well, I kind of lied again, because you can attach the Kinesis Data Analytics application to Kinesis Stream and also to Kinesis Firehose. And it can act as sort of a consumer because it processes the data from the Firehose and then you can send it forward to a Lambda function which does something else with that. And that's exactly how we use it. So our Kinesis Analytics applications uh, aggregate some data um, about the events that happen and send it to, to a Lambda called Reward Lambda. And then if we go like way back to the beginning of my presentation, I was talking about the thing that we do with uh, image personalization for different users. And we use uh, multi-armed bandit models for that. And they, of course, need some rewards information from something. So we get that rewards from the uh, user interaction data, of course. So we show you a picture that corresponds to, well, that represents the video in Arena. 
And if you liked it and you pressed it and you start to watch the, the video, we take it as a good sign and we want to reward that image in, in our model. So we need to send a reward to it. So basically we need to get the information in as real time as possible about which images were clicked and which videos were played. And we do that using Kinesis Analytics. So for example, we attach a small Kinesis Analytics application which aggregates uh, video play events within a half a minute a time window, and then it forward. It does some filtering, and then it forwards them to the uh, rewarder lambda. And rewarder router is pretty much similar to the event router that I discussed before or explained before. Uh, instead of sending the events to another stream, it just sends them to to the models it wants to to reward. So it, based on the information it gets to the, from the Kinesis Analytics, it decides to which model to reward and how. So that's how we use it. And basically, Kinesis Analytic application might look just like a simple SQL, something like this. So you select some user ID, program ID, some program ID count from a stream, and then you aggregate it with a 30-second uh, so-called tumbling window. So every 30 seconds, it will aggregate the data and send it to, to a Lambda function. And that's good also for the reason that you don't invoke a Lambda function for every single play event, because that would be quite a lot. You aggregate them in small enough windows, and, and then you save quite a lot on, on Lambda cost. But basically, this part of the pipeline, it doesn't cost anything, though it does a lot. Um, well, here is pretty much the serverless pipeline from beginning to the end. So data come, like user interaction data comes in. We get it to our analytics collector, Fargate uh, cluster. We send it forward to Kinesis Stream. If that di didn't happen, they go to a dead letter queue. And if it did, uh, there is a router lambda that is listening to the Kinesis Stream. It gets the records from there. It filters them. It decides which goes where. It routes them to different Kinesis firehoses. Firehoses then process it, write it to the data lake, and also there is Kinesis Analytics applications attached to diff different Kinesis firehoses, which collect some data, send it to a reward router, and the reward router re rewards the models, and you get personalized arena. Pretty much like that. Well, there's many other things involved. And of course, we have other personalization uh, models, not only the, the image personalization, and we also always try trying new stuff, but that's one example. So, um, what have we learned along the way? Well, a lot of stuff, but I've collected a small, a small compilation of those. So, first of all, Kinesis error handling. And when you look at this code, well, this is the put records function that I mentioned in the beginning. So, you give it the payload and there is the callback. And if an error happened, it logs the error. So, can anybody spot what is wrong here? Tommy doesn't say anything. Well, apart from it being JavaScript, of course. I'll tell you what's wrong here, or I first tell and then show. The problem is, when you write a batch of records to Kinesis Stream, it almost always returns a success. Because, well, it returns errors only if there was a network problem or things like that, which happens pretty rarely. What happens most of the time is that you exceed the throughput or either entire stream or one of the shards. It can happen when you have burst, uh, bursts of, of incoming data. And if that happens and part of the batch fails, you still get the success code. You never get the error. And actually, it can get even worse. The entire batch or every single record in that batch can fail and you still get a success. And you know what? We have been luck happy to look at the clean logs and not see a single error from Kinesis and think that things are just fine. Well, they weren't. And this is actually how we are supposed to do things. So instead of looking at just the error, you look at the response. And the response contains a field called failed record count, and it tells you how many records failed in that particular batch. And if it's greater than zero, you have to do some error handling. You have to retry the failed records. You, you have to do some redelivery and stuff. But never assume that if you get a success, things are good. They aren't. And talking about the bursts and stuff, so. Uh, as I mentioned, the Kinesis limits are per second, so you have 1,000 records per second. Uh, the problem here is that the way you follow those limits or you can monitor those limits is the CloudWatch metrics. And the CloudWatch metrics are actually at the best per minute. So 
you look at the CloudWatch metrics and you're like, I'm fine. I have plenty of shards open. I have plenty of throughput available. The limit isn't even close. And then still you get throughput exceeded exceptions, actually a lot of them. And well, there's the question, if you have 5,000 records per minute and in one shard, can you exceed the throughput? And the answer is, of course, yes, because if first 4,000 of records come in the first second, and then the rest come during the, the rest of the minute. So the rest go through pretty nicely. But from that first 4,000 records, only 1,000 gets in, and the rest are just discarded if you are not doing proper error management or processing. So it's pretty tricky when you just look at the metrics and think skies are blue and the sun is shining and everything is great. It's not. And we have learned it the hard way, unfortunately. So next one. Firehose scales, you remember the Firehose, the excellent fully managed service that loads your data to a data lake. You don't have to manage anything, it, it's just magic. So it scales endlessly, right? Well, you read the documentation, it says it's a fully managed service that automatically scales to match the throughput of your data. Sounds good so far, but you keep on reading, which you always should, and you see this. When direct put is configured as the data source, each Kinesis data firehose delivery stream is subject to the following limits. And yes, of course, they will tell about the limits being soft and you can rise them and, and so on and so forth. But there are limits and you need to know about that. And the thing is that there isn't an even, uh, unlike the, the Kinesis data, uh, Kinesis stream, there isn't even a metric that will tell you that something is wrong. No, nothing tells you that the throughput was exceeded. Nothing tells you that the throughput ex exists even, like the throughput limit. You look at the metrics, everything is fine. You look at your firehose, everything is fine. Well, you guessed it, it's not. Because the very same way as it can happen with the Kinesis stream, you send the batches and part of that batch can fail. And you will never know until you process the response from that batch, and you have to know that. And talking about knowing about problems, logging. So if you're anything like me, you think logging or you thought logging is great and as many logs as I put in my application, better I can follow what's happening and how the things are working and I then can kind of go through the things when things don't go exactly as they are supposed to. So logging. The thing with logging in Lambda is that if Lambda function is logging, even without having a single line of uh, log code in your Lambda function, it will uh, write three log lines per Lambda invocation. So it always has the start function line, end function line, and then the report. So basically, each time you invoke a Lambda, it logs three lines of logs. And then, well, in our router Lambda, we had one line of uh, logging saying, everything is fine, routing went well. So we had four lines of logging in our Lambda function. And again, it still doesn't sound that bad, but when you think that it's invoked around 3 million times per day, 3 million times per four, 12 million log lines, just to tell you that everything's fine. And you know, you may or may not at some point get a message, a careful message from your ops team asking, do you really need to spend 8,000 euros on logging per month? Logging, which just says everything is fine. So those are things you don't really think about before you go like bigger scale, but keep this in mind. And, and custom metrics and all sorts of metrics, in my opinion, is a much better way to monitor your Lambda than just logging everything that's happening inside. So to summarize some of the lessons we learned, you need to always learn about the limits because in the AWS or anywhere, per se, there are always limits. They might be soft limits, so the limits that you can actually increase when you submit a ticket to the AWS support and they ask you why do you need it and what do you need it for and whatnot. You can do that, but there are also hard limits. And still, even if they are soft limits, they are limits and you need to know about them because if something stops working for mysterious reasons, you need to know that that's one of the options. And talking about the limits, you need to keep a close eye on your concurrent Lambda invocations. So as I say, the default limit is 1,000, and it's pretty easy, like surprisingly easy to get to that limit, especially nowadays with Lambda supporting uh, SQS invocation, and it pretty much can scale out of hand if you don't put some limits on it. So 
always pay, pay close attention because you just might run out of the Lambda budget that you have for your account. Always deep dive into error handling and never assume things. So you assume you got a success code and everything is fine, you are probably wrong. And every single service in AWS has some flavor, some its own twist on error handling, and you better know it before you get deep into it and before things get really, really, really bad. So important stuff. And if you get lost in all the documentation and all the things, because you get like tons of information about AWS services, even from the AWS documentation on its own, and it's sometimes even contradicting. So if you get completely lost, I would highly recommend don't hesitate and ask AWS support. If you formulate your question well enough, they will answer in many, many details, and they will probably tell you stuff that you can't find in any documentation. They will tell you stuff, very valuable stuff, that you wouldn't know otherwise. So highly recommend it. It might take a couple of days, but they will answer. And well, finally, once again, to borrow words with the words of Dr. Vernon Vogels, and this is probably his most famous one, everything fails all the time, and especially on a bigger scale. So you better be prepared for that, and you better fail fast. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? You've got to help me out. I, I didn't even go over time. I'm, I'm shocked. Was I too fast? There's, uh, do we have the microphone? Yeah, you need to help me out with questions. I don't even know how to ask them at this point. Yep. You can try. Uh -huh. Yes, Re really fantastic uh, presentation. But, Thank you. Uh, uh, one question, um, uh, and this is something that uh, we come uh, across with uh, AVS, is that uh, uh, is there some service that could uh, uh, kind of have the guaranteed delivery and deliver only once? Service that delivers only once. Well, I think SQS is like that. The f uh, first in, first out, SQS would be your choice. With, yeah, you're right. With Kinesis, it's uh, at least once delivery guarantee. So you yeah. can have uh, duplicates, especially in, in uh, redelivery and all this kind of error processing way. But I think SQS promise you that, promises you that, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, testing purposes. So how do you test actually the new pipelines? Let's say that you want the new analytics and you are applying it, and then you need to test somehow, training the data somehow, uh, especially considering the GDPR. How do you do it in, a G in AWS? I think it's two separate questions. I mean, GDPR and testing. I know, I'm sorry. They really go in different. And I'm not sure I want to start a GDPR conversation. Right okay, here on the stage, we can continue about it. I, I think you can find me at the bar. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, with the testing. So of course we do all the unit testings of all the of the lambdas and, and stuff like that. Uh, one thing that we use a lot is uh, performance testing with a framework called Fluid EO. If I don't know if you're familiar with that, so we send a massive amount of requests to our analytics collector uh, service, and then we kind of watch how the pipeline develops and things like that. We, we monitor all the all the crucial metrics, or at least we try to now when we know about them, and and all that kind of thing. So. Pretty much unit testing and performance testing is the, is the main, and, and monitoring, I would say, is the main way we do it nowadays. All right, thank you. Thanks. Got a question here. OK. Thank you for the presentation. It thank was you. great. Uh, I have a question regarding the logging. Mm -hmm. So how did you solve it, actually? Oh, well, there's three lines of code. And it, it's, it's funny annoying. that you should ask. <laughs> Basically, we disabled all the logging at that point because of like, no, 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 no. I even remember that sunny day that we were sitting with Tommy under a nice tree, green tree near the Ule office. And we were like, let's just block it and like it never happened. But um, the thing is, we, we don't really need it in that particular case, we have a highly invoked Lambda. 
it does pretty basic stuff. And if something doesn't like delivery to Firehose, for example, doesn't go through, we send uh, the, um, custom CloudWatch metrics, so we collect it through that. But we don't use logging anymore. It was kind of a hard lesson to learn. And one more mm -hmm. question about infrastructure as a code. Mm -hmm. Do you use Terraform or Service Yes, we framework? do Terraform, or we use Terraform explicitly. Actually, entire Ule uses Terraform. It's pretty much what, what we do there. And, and yes, everything is, is coded and everything is automated. We, we don't do anything by hand, basically. Everything is in the code. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Um, what about the recommendation themselves? So you collect the data, but um, have you thinking combining with a Yuho presentation about the artificial intelligence? Who, who, who actually does the, <laughs> the recommendations? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, we do some artificial intelligence involved in our recommendations, of course, and we are constantly developing and trying to come up with some new fancy things. It's not my area of responsibility, but I can give you some contact information of really smart guys who can answer all your questions about neural networks and reinforcement learning and online learning and all the recommendation systems in the world, so no worries. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Thank you. Uh, what's your take on, on portability of, of the serverless solutions like this? Uh, if the client would like to uh, move on to Azure or, like or Google, Lock, you Google, mean. Google, uh, Google Cloud. How do you think this could be ported to uh, another cloud platform? Well, first of all, I don't think this is a real possibility in this case. I'm pretty sure that Ule is invested in using AWS because it's so, it's everywhere. It's not only our pipeline, it's basically the entire ULA infrastructure. It's, or at least most of it is on AWS. And you guys who work there can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, if that day comes, <laughs> there are much more problems than just the serverless solutions. But as, at least as far as I'm aware, there are uh, equivalents of Lambda functions both in Azure and, and in Google Cloud. So I don't think that will be a problem. But I just think that migrating such a huge infrastructure from one cloud to another would be quite a pain. And I'm not sure it's worth it. But I, I think it's an ongoing uh, discussion about about uh, vendor locking and serverless, yes. Yeah. But but I think it's going to be solved with every major cloud providers having their solution for that and them being somewhat compatible in some sense. But that's my best take at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe one more question. Oh. <laughs> Run. <laughs> Okay, hi. I hope hi. And enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Uh, but uh, regarding the, the last slide, you were talking about failure tolerance and this kind of stuff. Uh, I was wondering, are you doing any kind of oh. chaos engineering experiments to, to test your failure tolerance? That's actually a really good one. And I've been wanting to kind of get into that at some point. I mean, doing the chaos engineering. But at the best, what we do is just performance testing, and we try to load our system as much as possible and to see will it survive or not. But yeah, that would be really interesting. If you have any ideas how it would work in this sort of a contest, context, I'm really happy to hear them. Yeah, it's a cool topic. I'm not an expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting topic, but yeah. not yet. My answer is not yet. Yeah. Maybe next year I will tell you about mm. the exciting chaos engineering things we do at ULE. Who knows? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take that last question there. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. A couple of minutes here. So, handling the throughput issues, have you considered to use some kind of reactive stream framework in a way that, for instance, applying in the lambda and back to the pressure of the, of the Kinesis data storage? Excuse me, I didn't quite get the beginning of the question. So, have you considered using some kind of reactive frame, reactive streams? Reactive streams? Yes. No, I don't think we have, and I don't really think we have any need for that, because at the moment, we, I think we tackled most of the problems that we used to have with Kinesis streams, and, and Tommy can correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> he says yes. Um, yeah, we, we just basically used the things that are provided out of the box by AWS and try, try to leverage on that and, and do the error management or kind of error handling the best we can, basically, but, but haven't considered now. All right, thanks. Thank you.
Thank you. Let's give Anna a fair hand of applause. Thank <laughs> you.